Bachelor and a PhD student at the Department of Archaeology and Social Anthropology at the University of Tromsø in Norway. My PhD is connected to the project Object Matters, Archaeology and Heritage in the 21st Century, which have three main areas of interest, namely materiality, memory, the aspects of material and contents and ethical things, among other topics. As as seen, the title of my talk today is Rural Reminders, Enveloping in Urbanity, Encroaching Wilderness, the Case of a Ruining Landscape Garden in Norway. One of the cases my PhD project explores is Retiro, a ramshackle and abandoned 19th century landscape garden and estate. The name I sound familiar because the builder borrowed the name for the famous Boon Retiro Park in Madrid, which he had visited and been partly inspired by. The retiro I'm referring to, however, is located much farther north, in the town of Molde, on the western coast of Norway. Molde is a municipality, a mid-sized Norwegian town with about 26,000 inhabitants. The town is situated on a strip of low land on the north side of the Fannefjord, surrounded by a hinterland with small farms, mountains, and a diverse woodland. Today, retiro is the largest green space in the city of Molde. Retiro has been neglected and partly abandoned for approximately 75 years. Okay, you see. Except for the estate's villa, which was, and this immediate surrounding was started to dilapidate after the last member of the family who owned the property auction of it, it off in 2005. The reasons for a garden's neglect are many. One of them being that the ownership became complex when the property was partitioned in 2005. The northern half of the property was bought by the municipality of Molde, while the southern half, containing the Retiro Villa and other buildings, was bought by a private property development company. The fate of Retiro in the coming future is currently unresolved and caught up in disputes between different owners, urban planning, and the evaluation of its heritage value. Instead of dismissing Retiro's dereliction out of hand, its present ruining and appearance and effects are the focus of my research in this case study. One of my interests is to locate and document things that are overlooked or incompatible with the effort to rescue or alter the site in a heritage perspective. This might be how things are changed compared to how they are described in historical sources, how things have accumulated after the site was abandoned, and how things such as plants and objects persist in its present derelict mode of being. In short, I'm interested in the palimpsestic nature of Retiro in the present day. What I would like to focus in this presentation are these questions. How can we characterize the present day of Retiro, which is a remnant of a once rural landscape that has slowly been developed by a growing city? How does a rural past persist at Retiro? And it's become or exposed something else to a dereliction, something more akin to a fair wilderness. Before we delve further into the landscape of the present day Retiro, I will give you a brief overview of the history of Retiro, which is interesting in itself and one of the reasons why there is now a growing interest in restoring the ruined property to its former glory. The building of the garden and the villa was finished in 1874. There's a picture with the, with the builder of the garden, Christian Jonsson, standing in front of the building, dated to 1874. The, Danish, well, the, build, the villa and the garden was built by the Danish consul, a fish merchant, Christian Johnson, who was, had his permit and residence in other town. The villa and the accompanying garden's residence was elaborate for its time, made in Swiss chalet style, which was fashionable in Norway during the second half of the 19th century. The Retiro property had a circumference of perhaps 1.2 kilometers, and the total area measured about 8.4 hectares. This, of course, is not even comparable to the large landscapes garden elsewhere in Europe, but it was an impressive land example of landscape architecture <coughs> in present-day Norway. The property was located approximately two kilometers east of the city of Molde, which at the time was a small town with only 1,700 inhabitants. 
the rural landscape was dotted with small farmstead, cultivated land, boat houses, only future would expect from the 19th century countryside in Norway. It was not only a rural in its placement, but the landscape garden was also in some sense designed to look and feel rustic by artistically and sanctified the character of the local nature, vegetation, and rural culture. As a telling example of this, the garden even had a small hunting lodge with fully built on one of the islands in an artificial made pond, ironically named the Atlantic Ocean. However, Retir also incorporated lots of non-native plants, such as silver firs, Japanese cypress trees, hemp, castor oil plants, and many other species. The imported flora, together with exotic garden ornaments, gave Retir an eclectic appearance, where the national romantic idea of the quintessential Norwegian native was adorned with strange plants, volcanic rocks from Italy, mass-produced plaster statues of classical characters such as Hercules and Triton. Despite the idea of being a private property, Johnson kept it open to the public. It was not only local populace who took advantage of this offer. The building of the garden corresponded with the golden years of tourism in Molde, which lasted approximately from 1880 to the, to the Second World War. That's one of the pictures looking eastwards towards the town of Molde from a nearby hill. And you see the battle, German battleships probably entourage with uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. So the both English and German tourists visited this small Norwegian town of Molde. And one of the most famous visitors was Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, who several times visited it here and one time offered to rent the property from Johnson. But uh, Johnson he turned down the offer without any reasons really. For a number of reasons, such as prohibitively expensive maintenance, German occupation during the Second World War, changing owners, the retiro property, especially the landscape garden, has fallen in disrepair, of course, through the last 75 years. A local historian commented that the garden could not be characterized as anything but a ruin after visiting the property in 1953. A decade later, a garden historian observed also some plant, despite being abandoned by the gardener, continued to thrive in a no derelict landscape and still gave it an air of romance. This still roots true somehow today, where amongst the overgrown parts, burk tickets, spruce grouse, empty ponds, rotten logs, and yesterday's garbage, one can still encounter plants that are thrived in the absence of a gardener. Alien and invasive plants, such as Japanese knotweed, thrive in the present day retiro. Displaying their um, ambiguous contemporary identity <coughs> as persistent material memories of the garden's glorious past and as aliens and blacklisted species on national biodiversity programs. A survey of the biodiversity at Rituro conducted in 2013, the surveyors noted that they contain a rich variety of old and planted trees. However, the surveyors commented that the remove, recommended to re remove the species of plants that define as high risk that is defined by Norwegian <coughs> Biodiversity Center. Concerned about of the historical heritage of the floral remnants territory is not unfound because the knotweed and yellow archangel, two species have started to creep outside all property borders. So it's not only the city invading the old landscape garden, but also the city is spreading into the rest of the town. It is not a forgotten word in the present day urban landscape of Molde, however. Recently, archaeologists, art historians, architects, heritage officials, and the local museum have shown interest in historic, the historical past of Etero and its potential future. In particular, the condition of the villa has raised concerns, as evident by a string of articles in the local newspaper. The private company owning a villa have been accused of speculative dilapidation, where they gamble on leaving the prop building to ruin beyond repair in order to make way for new property development. Representatives from the county's Department of Cultural Heritage since the early 2000s indicated that Retiro had a culturally valuable and should become a protected heritage site. One of the prospective futures of the site 
is that it might be added to a national list of green spaces with a historical landscape of national importance. The plans for the property planned by the municipality, the proposed to rebuild the historical garden, at the same time adapt the property to its contemporary urban surroundings by making a kindergarten in the old villa while reconstructing its facade and open up for new housing in the southeastern part of the landscape garden. Today, Retiro is located in the middle of the city of Molde. Its closest neighbors consist of a sports center, a large cemetery, residential areas, and open park built over the original shore of the property. You see it just below here. The town has in the post-war years encircled Retiro, engulfed the rural landscape and rendering the park and the garden as the original rural landscape as an enclave within the urban townscape. How was this creeping urban development affected the landscape of Retiro? <coughs> Maybe the effect does not appear too significant. One might even claim that the contrast produced by the enveloping city has enhanced the garden's rural ideal like a frame. However, on closer look, entering the landscape with an archaeological perspective reveals several delicate and inconspicuous traces of how it's been affected by its new urban context. The urban context has contributed to accumulation of different structures and artifacts in the landscape. This includes everything from vacuum cleaners, wall LCD monitors, pots, sweaters, food, packaging, stripped bike frames, grip seal bags, syringes, umbrellas, window frames, toys, and many other stray objects. These objects can be memories of events that occurred within a garden, witnesses of a larger story about the town of Molde that has not had the chance to accumulate anywhere else. Or they even lack any apparent history or meaning, loose, stray objects. As such, the urban surroundings have created fresh sediment on the surface of the hero. However, some of the original landscape have in some sense been directly altered or affected by the ur new urban context. This is especially true for the serpentine gravel paths, which was originally over two kilometers long. Today, approximately one kilometer of the path is still accessible because people and animals have continually used them after this garden was abandoned by the gardeners in this rake. The Tiro has also been inscribed with the rich repertoire of Abero glyphs, graffiti, and even during the winter, winter you can find nixoglyphs, people playing in the snow, traces of activity. Workers employed by the municipality regularly remove trees that have been blown down by the wind. The Tiro is choose in some sense cultivated and cared for, even if the place can be characterized as abandoned. This is also evident how several campsites have been treated. The municipality has removed some of the accumulated garbage, but the most striking thing they, must, they have done is to clear away the trees and bushes of these campsites, not in order to attract more campers, but rather to make them less secluded and less inviting for unauthorized visitors, creating a contrast to the previous ideal of a romantic and landscape garden encased with trees in a tight, framed landscape. The interior has not faded away in the urban shadow of concrete and asphalt. It's rather tried and developed on, mostly on its own terms, dictated partly by past structures and the material effects. In the recent years, local people have telling me started to refer to the interior as, as the retiro forest. In fact, the retiro probably contains a larger amount of old trees than a natural forest in the town's hinterland. In its derelict isolation, from the rural woodlands, it has been partly spared from systematic logging and forestry. Some areas of the garden contain trees and that have been planted and lived there since before the garden was even constructed. Fragments of the rural landscape and ecology that was integrated into the garden's original design. Field clearance kerns that certainly precedes the construction of the Retiro is another, another present in the rural landscape predating its birth. The well-known garden and landscape historian John Dixon Hunt has written about how horticulture can be regarded as the third nature. 
the first net is defined as the pristine, pre-human environment, while the second nature, an agricultural used landscape. Scholars such as Ingon Kovarik have added the fourth nature to the equation, which consists of ecology that has evolved within an urban and industrial landscape, where woodlands have developed independently from direct human interference in large number of non-native species. Could the Ritiro be defined as a fourth nature? In some ways it can. Its woodland contained a good amount of non-native species. It had the chance of developing on its own without much human interference or censorship. However, rather than having been evolved with an urban and industrial landscape, it has rather persisted as a remnant of the landscape garden, as a third nature in the ruin. The post-rural landscape of Retiro might be described as feral, rather than a site that is returning to original and natural wilderness. As Farley and Roberts write in the book, Edgelands, a journey into England's true wilderness, wild animals and plants rely only on their instinct and DNA. While, while, while being feral means you have a history, a proper backstory, a kind of cultural load that is an indivisible part of his being and becoming. The further state that today the feral is the new wild, which might be resonating with the new ideas about the Anthropocene. The feral does not necessarily only refer to fauna, flora. In some sense, it can also be applied to artifacts that somehow escaped human care. Farley and Robert used the discarded feral car seats as the emblem for their edge lands. Places that lie at the edges of city and villages, places that are not quite rural nor urban. Fairy heritage, such so as Retiro, might be described as too heterogeneous to tell the orderly history aspect of the well kept heritage sites, but also lacking the purity of the utterly vile, characterized by the total absence of human influence and human past. In that sense, it's neither rural nor urban nor natural nor cultural. This strange and perhaps ineffable character makes the tear void or disturbance in the eyes of city planners and private property developers. A site that no one, on one hand, has a distinct history which can be read about in books or seen in old photographs, but on the other hand, have a vague present which is mediated through can contrast with what objects are simple, familiar, and strange at the same time. The archaeologist Laurent Oliver has noted that the contemporary process of global urbanization which has led to a disappearing rural world has largely been seen as uninteresting by archaeologists. This claim might surely debate it as we've seen from the papers today, but it's clear that archaeological focus has likely been on post-industrial landscape, ruins, urban sites, and not the least in the development of archaeology of a more recent past. In some sense, this is understandable. The rural hedges of overgrown fields Stones, ramshackle barns are much more understated than massive industrial facilities and the traces of the global industrial production. The, despite some post-rural landscape can be less materially striking, does not mean they are less interesting or important. The effects and materiality of direct and mediated landscape, post-rural landscapes are important to investigate because the map people, people use them and in the present landscape also things they happen upon <coughs> by chance, some small memories of a rural past. The document that explores these landscapes on their own terms in the present day can be the insights of such memories can affect people, or what the landscape contains, cultivates and mediates. With regards to Retiro, I intend to keep returning, continue recovering what things change, move, grow, and multiply, and not at least persist in the landscape. In all likelihood, Retiro will be rebuilt or transformed in some way in the near future, either as a reconstructed heritage garden, residential properties, or a combination of both these possibilities. It will be interesting to follow how these things endure this landscape, how a recultured Retiro will compare to a fairer landscape of today. Thank you.